welcome to Speechless. We're glad to have you here, uh, live from the SCC studios in White Bear Lake, also live from SPNN in St. Paul. Uh, this show goes out to a lot, lot of the communities west of the uh, Mississippi River, or St. Paul, and uh, excuse me, St. Paul and East. Uh, and so we're glad to have you here. Just some interesting. Uh, stuff in the news. We're going to be talking about domestic violence. We're going to be talking about um, uh, what was the other issue? Oh yeah, pro-life issues. It's going to tie that into Maplewood and the mayor of Maplewood and just some hypocrisy that's going on and some of the comments that she's making. And uh, then we got a whole lot of other stuff, some updates on McDonald. Uh, there's some legislation going through on with police officers carrying body cameras and how long they can keep information. Also, a family law bill passed the Senate. It's going to be heard in the uh, House tomorrow. And then uh, uh, so that's going through the process there, some big changes. Um, also, a federal appeals court ruling. Uh, that said the uh, National Secur Security Agency, the phone surveillance is not legal, uh, that the way they're using it is not even written into law that they can use it the way with the mass transfers of data. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the refugee situation, the Somali community up in St. Cloud. We got a little video on that. All, all kinds of odds and ends here. And so we want to Today I'm going to kind of do the main thing first, and I want to talk about the NBA, WNBA, and basketballs, the uh, silence on domestic violence within the NBA, WNBA, and Brittany Greiner, um, who is a professional basketball player, um, had a domestic violence incident with her um, significant other, girlfriend, whatever, uh, that ended up in biting, a uh, lot of physical damage, uh, blood was drawn, a lot of minor injuries, uh, bite marks and a bloodied lip. Um, so, but it was domestic violence. And Greiner acknowledged the seriousness of the situation, vowing it will not happen again. Of course, if you're a man and you say it will not happen again, that's not good enough. And so the NBA, the NFL has done things to sanction players for domestic violence. Will the WNBA sanction Greiner for her domestic violence? Um, and the, this just as an important issue that people are treated fairly on this issue. So if you're going to call out one group of people based on their professional athletic ability, you need to hold the same standard to another group of people based on their athletic ability. And, and, and it doesn't matter whether they're men or women. And so there has not been any discipline by the... Uh, WNBA yet that I know of. Uh, it may be coming, but this is definitely um, a problem that needs to be dealt with. And of course, domestic violence really doesn't happen between from women. You know, that's kind of the perception that's out there that, you know, Harriet Tubman Institution, the local Maplewood domestic violence uh, shelter is is starting to acknowledge that men get abused too, um, but they rarely acknowledge that women get abused by women or that women, men are getting abused by men or, uh, or other women. So they're starting to acknowledge that. They're going to have actually a discussion on that coming up um, here in September, and I'll get you information on that later. But um, I, I think there's changes coming on this issue, and it's being a lot more public. But domestic violence against women shouldn't happen, and women who commit it should be prosecuted like men are. 
Okay, and that, I mean, that's kind of a first step. Should some of these levels of domestic violence, should the criminal penalties be raised higher? You know, maybe, and I think some situations, yes. But I think the first thing is you got to get it to the level where women are charged just like men. And that would play a significant role in the decreasing of domestic violence right there. Because um, the studies show women initiate domestic violence half of the time and, uh, and being mutual uh, initiations of domestic violence. And if it wouldn't happen, if women would be, if it would be acknowledged that women commit domestic violence, that would go a long way to stopping domestic violence. All right, now I'm going to bring into the pro-life uh, issues here, and I have some graphics in there. Um, so, uh, good luck. Well, let's do this. Um, <clears throat> and I didn't give you the numbers there, so you're going to have to guess. There's one purple one there that I want to bring up. Baby saved from abortion after giving parents a thumbs up in the ultrasound. Um, so... <clears throat> It's right down there on the slides. Do you see it at all? There, there we go. So there's the baby's arms giving a thumbs up to the parents. Um, they were, the parents were given uh, bad news about their child. Uh, and the baby's name is Chanel. And she was diagnosed with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And they were considering aborting her. And the doctors recommended it. Um, because she would need to have some surgeries. And um, so only half her heart was beating in the still. Uh, but then while they were doing the ultrasound, there you see the baby gives this thumbs up. And the parents took it as, I want to live, you know. And so they did not abort the baby. Uh, and the baby came out uh, with the heart problems. They did some heart two heart surgeries, they put a stent in, and then let's go to the next graphic, and uh, there's the baby. So the picture you saw prior was at 20 weeks, and this is now Chanel, uh, who is, you know, a human, believe it or not. Uh, it's hard for some people to admit, and <clears throat> in particular, we can bring her back here now, uh, one particular abortionist uh, who performed over 40,000 abortions. And so let's go to the next graphic there. Uh, his name is Stojan Adasevic. You see a picture of him. But he was a, uh, in Serbia. He was an abortion doctor in Serbia. Serbia performed over 40,000 abortions, and he became a pro-life activist. Um, some people say he did more like 60,000 abortions. I don't know how they came up with those numbers, but now he's an active pro-life person. And he describes what happened to change his mind. Uh, and the first one is two, two issues came up to him. He had an unusual series of dreams. Uh, disturbing and in a disturbing experience he has while doing abortions. Now, most of his abortions, he said, were prior, uh, you know, within the first couple months, um, which typically means between one and two months of having the abortion. But as he describes the procedure that helped change his mind, I opened up the womb, tore the placenta, the birth waters flowed out, and I got to work on the inside with my abortion forceps. I grabbed something, crushed it a little, removed it, and threw it onto a cloth. I looked, I see a hand, quite a large hand. The child was three, perhaps four months old. I had to measure it. At three months, a preborn baby is fully formed with fingers and toes. All the organs and body systems are present. The baby has fingerprints and breathes amniotic fluid in preparation for life outside the womb. Now, let's understand this. That's what's necessary for the baby to live inside the room. Uh, so it's, it's viable inside the room in those conditions. It's not viable if you take it outside the womb at, at that point in time. Uh, but it's viable then. So um, the, the doctor goes on. I don't even know if he's a doctor, but abortionist. Someone had spilled some iodine on part of the table and 
the hand fell in such a way that the nerve endings came in talk, contact with the iodine. And what happened? I look and I say, my God, the hand is moving by itself. Nevertheless, I nevertheless carry on with my forceps and again catch something, crush it, and pull it out. I think to myself, let it not be a leg. I pull it out and look, a leg. I want to put the leg on the table carefully so that it isn't near the moving hand, and as my arm falls, I hear a bang behind my back. I jump, and automatically my grip on the forceps loosened. At this very moment, the leg completed a somersault and fell next to the hand. I look, both the hands and the legs are moving by themselves, and nevertheless, once again, direct my instrument into the womb and begin to crush everything inside. I think to myself that all I need to complete the picture is the heart. I continue to crush and crush and crush until I am sure that I have grounded that I have ground everything inside into a pulp and once again pull out the forceps. As I pull out the mess, thinking it would be be bone fragments, I lay it on the cloth. I look and I see a human heart contracting and ex expanding and beating, beating, beating. I thought I would go mad. I can see that the heartbeat is slowing ever more slowly and more slowly still until it finally stops completely. Nobody could have seen what I had seen with my own eyes and the more convinced I was I had killed a human being. You know, which, which I just find interesting. Um, and he goes on, you can, look, you can find this on liveactionnews.org. Uh, a lot of stories on pro-life issues, uh, but what I found interesting is that he did all these abortions and never had that experience, um, which I find rare, but and, and unlikely, um, because may, maybe over there you don't have to count the body parts to make sure you got the whole thing out, so the health of the woman isn't a real factor in, in the abortion. So they pulled the um, uh, so uh, he changed his mind and now is pro-life and is one of the leaders in the pro-life movement and I, I find it interesting that a lot of these abortion doctors after they've done you know the 30, 40,000 abortions some of them then become pro-life I don't know if it's because they you know made all their money they needed to make and they're doing financially fine so they feel they can leave or they're serious about it but the ones that I've seen that are public putting their names out there and are, are at risk they all know it's a baby they all know that's a human life but for some reason this doctor didn't equate it with killing a human being until then but everybody needs to know and I think everybody knows it is a human Although a lot of women don't because they've been bought this lie and told this lie. And when these parents who saw the ultrasound of their baby, that it was a human, then decided not to abort, even with the medical problems. Uh, so interesting news. Well, how does that tie into Maplewood? And we're going to go to uh, not the, don't do number one, Dallas, in the order. Do number two in the order. We're going to do two, three, and then one. Uh, <clears throat> but it, it's just interesting here uh, we're not going to see Mark Bradley give a presentation uh, to the city council we're not going to play his comments although good the point I want to make is what's going on in Maplewood and and Mark Bradley made some comments about the city drinking the Kool-Aid just giving everything away uh, and this in particular with the development in the Gladstone area, just giving money away, charging the taxpayers and giving it to other people. And where there's nobody has any stake in this. And just people are getting benefits for moving in there, they're getting reduced rents. And nobody has a stake in this. On the back end, people have. Uh, the person's doing the development, but they're not putting any money into it, but it's costing you as a taxpayer a lot of money and you get no benefit. Only a select group of people are getting a benefit for this. And when there's plenty of places to live, we have a housing overstock, and now we're going to take money from people, raise their property taxes in order to pay for this. Um, it's, uh, it's not a low income, it's a low income housing 
uh, unit from my understanding. It's not Section 8, but low-income housing. And so he makes his comment, and what's happening in, in Visitor's presentation, uh, he, he talks about drinking the Kool-Aid. Okay, and cool, that's a euf euphemism for you bought the story and you bought it hook, line, and sinker. You're not questioning it, and it's going to end up costing people. Okay, and it's used in a variety of situations. It doesn't mean people are going to die, but of course, in this situation, and Jim Jones and them drinking the Kool Aid, people did die. Absolutely. All right, so. Uh, What's also happening as after visitors' presentations, now the Maplewood Council or the mayor is kind of giving a mayor speech about what people commented on, and people don't have a chance to comment back. So it makes it look like there's a dialogue going on. Instead of listening to the comments and then going on to your next section, the mayor has to respond in her mind. Somebody's telling her to respond to these comments and um, without without the person being talked about being able to respond. And, it, and it's outrageous. She should just be quiet and, and leave it alone or wait till her council presentations uh, at the end of the thing. Uh, so understand, you only get three minutes to speak, sometimes two minutes to speak. And so let's listen to what uh, mayor, the mayor had to say. And notice how she gets angry about drinking the Kool-Aid business. And it costs lives. Let's, let's listen to this. We are not jacking up the taxes, Mr. Bradley. We are increasing the tax base. No, we, we are not no, uh, working. No, this is not welfare. This is for working well, people, yeah, as Council Member Juneman talked about. We're going to be talking back and forth. And uh, we're, we're not talking back and forth. Well, I and uh, I guess I do have a right to speak it. The other thing was, I think that's just absurd when you talk about absurdity is when you talk about Kool-Aid and that Kool-Aid that you talk about killed people. You know that, right? We didn't drink the Kool-Aid. Uh, uh, part of Maplewood right now. Because that's, okay, that's what we Okay, it's too snow. What do we do here? Do we, what do we do? Some help. All right, with that, let's go on to the next uh, item. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion to approve this uh, condition use lot, the, uh, issue. All right, there's Chief Snell. Is my mic up? Yeah, there's Chief Snell. Oh, keep the video going. There's Chief Snell talking to Mark Bradley. Uh, and then eventually here you're going to see Chief Snell escort Mark Bradley uh, out of the meeting. Uh, and right. which is just so a terrible thing to do. Time. All she has to do is go to him and say, okay. hey, you know what, it's not your turn to talk. If you, you, if you talk again, we'll remove you. Instead, he, he got removed right away uh, and couldn't come back into the meeting. Um, so here, here's the thing. Um, and, I, and here's how I tie it into the abortion thing. Drinking the Kool-Aid, okay, the euphemism, and Mayor Slawick getting really angry at Mark Bradley and saying people died drinking the Kool-Aid and nobody's dying here. Uh, that was her reference. And, and the problem is uh, Mayor Slawick is pro-choice, pro-killing babies uh, left and right. I mean, she's drunk the Kool-Aid on the abortion issue and she could care less whether people die or not. She could care less because the choice of a woman, and that gets into the abuse situation, is more important than anything else. The women's right to choose is more important than domestic violence. It's more important against, against women and women committing domestic violence and women killing their babies. She's drunk the Kool-Aid and she is killing people and promoting the killing of people with her views there. Now, um, uh, <laughs> the, the, there's so much else going on, but we got a caller here. So, caller, do you have a comment or question? Thanks for calling in. Tim Kinley, thanks hey. for this show. You bet. Yeah, Mayor Nora Selwick in Maplewood. Is that, uh, it's a, she's a tragic figure. She's 14 years in the state legislature. Being, being trained, being trained by some of the best politicians 
I would think, in the state of Minnesota, sitting in thousands and thousands of hours of uh, how, uh, debate, <laughs> watching how to debate. Here, she is in control of that meeting, and the way she treats people right. is abominable. Uh, you would think that she was a freshman and was just a town bully yes. who has now been given the gavel. Right. It's amazing. Well, your, your point is really good there because you she would not have gotten away with saying what she said in the legislature. She would not have gotten away with that temper tantrum that she had. Uh, and as I watch, that's part, interesting. And as I watch her, yeah, as I watch her, I think I'm watching, you know, to appoint Kathy Juneman, the lady who clips her middle finger up at uh, a resident. And one thing about her is I'm wondering if she's now taking her direction from Kathy Juneman, if she wasn't trained in that skill or she didn't learn that from the state legislature, which I hope she wouldn't have. <laughs> I'm thinking maybe Kathy Juneman is pushing her in that direction, and she has to become basically just a puppet of Kathy Juneman. I've watched Kathy Juneman before put on these sorts of shows, and then she goes in the back and she laughs like a hyena and how she pushed somebody around like she did to Bob Fletcher. And to see Nora Solwick, who has all this experience and all this training, behave and conduct herself in the public like that. I mean, we know she eliminated the yeah. mayor's form. She eliminated uh, almost all conversation from uh, right. the city of Mayport. Yeah, and, 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 I, and, and I would say that all three of them on the council are, are very abusive. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I would, I would say that all three of the women have been very abusive on that council at times. Yes. And uh, the, you're right, Nora's training is not to act this way, so who is pulling the punches? Who is telling her you need to respond to these comments that are made? And she doesn't have to respond to them. That, that's the real issue. Uh, well, and she should have the skill. She should have the skill to respond to them. That shouldn't be a tough, uh, a tough feat for somebody who's had all the training experience. Right. And where she has. But if she doesn't want to because she can't control her temper. Right. Or she, uh, or there's, she has some other disability, she doesn't need to. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for the call, caller. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me short. You bet. Well, and that gets us to the next video. Um, well, first of all, when, when Nora Slawick, the mayor of Maplewood, mentions somebody's name, she goes, she goes uh, we're not jacking the taxes, Mr. Bradley. Okay, visitor time's over, okay? But she has to comment, we're not jacking the taxes, Mr. Bradley. You understand what happens when Mr. Bradley goes up and speaks, by the rules, he cannot mention the name of anybody that works for the city of Maplewood. He can't mention their name. It's not allowed. And you get called on the carpet for doing that. But here she goes and mentions his name. And once, so what he's, and, and the reason you can't mention somebody else's name that they get because they're not here to defend themselves. Okay, so when Nora Slawick mentions, and Mark Bradley knows this, that's the routine. So when Mark, uh, when Nora Slawick mentions Mark Bradley's name, he's there. He can defend himself. Okay, so that's why Mark Bradley was saying, hey, we're having a dialogue now. You mentioned my name. Okay, I get to speak now. Uh, we get to respond here. And that's why he was calling out from the audience you know, and, and wanting to speak and defend himself. And so here's this hypocrisy from Nora Slawick. Oh, the city council, because they're high and mighty, can name names, but we as citizens can't. That's just backwards. Uh, and so Mark Bradley's response was right. Are you going to let, are we going to have, we get to, are you going to let a debate? I get to debate because of your behavior here. You mentioned my name, so I get to respond. Because that's the reasoning behind not being able to mention any, anybody's name when you're going b before the council. Okay, let's watch the next clip and see another great hypocrisy of the uh, city council. And so I think it's important, you know, the, that the public 
uh, be able to hear the facts. And I hope our folks that have their cable shows out there are present both sides on those as well, because we know uh, they certainly should, uh, just like they like to present their facts here, we hope they prevent, present our facts there and what is accurate. Okay, all right. They are not presenting both sides when you go into Maplewood in their public hearings. They're not presenting our side of the story, okay? Yet, they're asking us to present their side. You understand the hypocrisy there? Okay, if you, Mayor Slawick, and the City Council would represent both sides of the equation, I, I could understand you being concerned about the cable TV programs not presenting your side. Okay, but you don't present. You only present your side. Okay, so, um, and then you want, you want us, we come in there so we can get, we get three minutes maybe to present our side. That's it. And then you get unlimited time to bash it. There's no dialogue. But you want us to present your side on our show without you showing up? Yet we have to go down there. You got an invitation to come on my show. Uh, matter of fact, uh, Inside Inside, Bob Zick went out and wrote a letter and said, uh, Mayor Slavik and um, uh, Col uh, Coleman, what, what, what's her position? I just drew a blank. <laughs> uh, Melinda Coleman, uh, city manager, come on the show anytime. Okay? And they declined. You know, so we got to go there to present our side, but they can't come here and present their side. You know, so you see, see the game that's getting played here. There's not no seriousness in her. It's just bashing. Um, so you know what? We're going to present our side here, and you cannot tell us what to present or force us to present it. <laughs> okay, it's not going to happen. Uh, and just try it. All right, let's see what happens. But I gave you an, an invitation, Melinda and uh, Nora, come on the show and, and let's talk. Um, sometimes just wondering why I leave out titles um, of names of people is because these are people. They're just flesh and blood. And the, the purpose of the title is to represent a position, but at times I want people to know that all they are is flesh and blood. Okay? And even though it's a representative government, they still are restricted severely in what they can do to you. Uh, which leads us to uh, a hearing that took place today in the Senate on body cameras that passed. And the House has a different version, uh, but a lot of good debate on that. And the big concern was our civil rights being eroded. And, and next week, I hope to have some clips from Roger Chamberlain and what he talked about. Um, this, this, what passed in the Senate was the police officers will get these body cameras, and any information collected is reserved for 90 days. And it's a rolling 90 days. And that information, um, if there is then an incident a report incident of a crime or whatever, then that can be information can be saved longer than the 90 days. Uh, but many in the House bill is arguing that no, it, it shouldn't be saved at all. I think the House is coming out with a 10-day issue, and there's a whole bunch of privacy issues with the body camera. I am not object to having the police officer have a body camera, but it can only be used and in, in a situation during arrest or, or having a crime take place. If nothing has happened, that information has to be destroyed. And, you know, people are looking now with all kinds of uh, data being collected on them from cell phones. Over a two-week period, some, you know, 1,400 hits or 3,800 hits uh, from the cell phone as to where a person is located. And so the, the loss of this privacy is is a huge a huge issue uh, that is taking place, uh, but in regards to that, um, so anyway, the Senate passed a bill. The House, I'm sure, it's coming up, and they're definitely going to have differences. Actually, very good likely that nothing will get passed this year uh, on a lot of these bills. You no, know, so a lot of games are going to be played up to the very end. 
But uh, the appellate court, and this is the second U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in Manhattan, uh, ruled that the NSA phone surveillance system is not legal. And they, they did it unanimously. Uh, and this is collecting phone records. Uh, in other words, they have to, in order to collect those records, they have to have a, a warrant. But the Second Court of Appeals uh, did permit the National Security Agency program to continue temporarily as it exists. Um, but it all but pleaded for Congress to better define where boundaries exist. So they're keeping it working as it exists. They want Congress to change the laws. Uh, this decision is going to be appealed, and then maybe the Supreme Court will hear it. Or if they don't, the uh, court's opinion stands at the appellate court. And then NSA will have to change their procedures. Uh, which I think would be good. Uh, and so NSA was saying, hey, we got the right to collect all this phone data. And, and the court was saying, here, uh, as the law is written, you don't have that right. You have the right to collect data, but even as it is written, you don't have that right. Just in the law, we don't even have to deal with the constitutional issue because you're just wrong on the way the law is written. Uh, it's pretty pretty interesting. So, but that's the nature of the police force and the police state. Where in the debate this afternoon in the Minnesota Senate on police body cams, um, Senator Brandon Peterson was saying we didn't even know that they had these uh, video surveillance until an undercover investigation came up to let us know they had these license plate leaders. Well, let me see. I know every prosecutor knew they had these. Every police officer knew they had them. Uh, people who were being scanned, I told people down there that they had them. Uh, my license plate got read a ton, you know. And so you would think it would be common knowledge, but evidently that's the word. They didn't know that it was common knowledge. Uh, go figure. Okay. Um, Let's go back to uh, the city of Grant, just kind of covering some things there and procedural issues. Of course, Maplewood was dealing with a little bit of procedural issues, how they behave with the citizens and how they interact with them. Uh, but there's been a longstanding, ever since this last election where Councilmember Lawrence Cedarstrom and Larry Lanou got elected on the uh, ruling council of three really uh, has been bullying them uh, very significantly. They've been, Lauren Cedarstrom and Larry Lanou have been fighting for their liberties on this and their right to speak, uh, but the other council members are depriving that. And so there are what's called Robert's Rules of Orders that uh, the city of um, Grant has established and they have other rules. Now, if you establish other rules for conducting a meeting, it's in writing, it's in your bylaws, you have it written down, those rules will supersede any Roberts rules because you voted on them and you elected to use these. But the city of Grant hasn't done that, but they do follow Roberts rules of orders. That's been explained over and over again. And so they have this item what's called the consent agenda. Normal things that come up month after month like bills for electricity, uh, standard things that come up over and over should be on the consent agenda. But what's happening is the City of Grant is putting things that need a discussion that not all the members of the City Council agree with, want to have a discussion. So even though the City puts it on there, they have the right by Robert's rules to pull that off a consent agenda. Consent agenda means everybody agrees. They're not controversial, just go with it. But what City of Grant is doing is putting controversial things onto their consent agenda. And then when Larry Lanou or Lauren Cedarstrom try to pull off some of the information, some of these topics to discuss them, uh, they're not being allowed to do that. The mayor, Tom Carr, uh, is 
the, the dictator, as he's referred to by many people in the community, is, being told, is, is telling them, no, you have to have a second on your motion. And, and so they get the second, and then there's there any discussion, and, you know, of course, no discussion on pulling it off. They vote three to two to pass the consent agenda. Well, it's just totally unlogical, totally backwards. And so these things don't, don't get talked, and therefore they don't get passed because they violated the rules. And this is where the city of Grant is in real big trouble. So if anything got passed on that consent agenda, it's not legitimate, okay, because it wasn't discussed. The things that were pulled off weren't discussed. I, I, I would say the things that were asked to be pulled off and weren't, those didn't pass. But the things that weren't asked to be pulled off and then it passed, yeah, fine. Uh, so, and Larry Lanou is trying to pull stuff off. So let's watch and see what happens in the city of Grant here. Moving on to the consent agenda. Uh, we'll approve the consent agenda. Uh, if somebody wants to remove right. something from the consent agenda, it's... I move to uh, make a motion of closing items in the consent agenda. Okay, well, it takes a motion, a second, and you have to... Second. Okay, and then you have to get the vote to remove from the consent agenda. Uh, it's a policy. Uh, right, is right. this discussion uh, for discussion? Briefly discussion. Sure. Okay. What are you trying to pull? What am I trying to pull, Mayor yep. Carr? Uh, Robert's rules, consent agenda. To extract an item, a member need only rise and request that an item be removed from the consent agenda. A request does not need a second, and it is not discussed, and no vote is <coughs> taken to remove it from the consent agenda. The extracted items are added to the regular agenda under the proper category for bringing up such items. Mayor Card, you've been doing this long enough. Uh, you, we have you on tape that says that we operate by Robert's rules. We, I'll provide a copy of the tape if you'd like that. Robert's rules does not need a, it doesn't need a second, it doesn't require a vote, it can't be discussed. It's simply the consent agenda of a member Want to pull some and have to be pulled and put on a regular agenda. So I have several items that I'd like to pull. Okay, well, first of all, Mr. Lynn, respond to you. We, we, that's fine, we can do that, but we also passed the special rules that this is how we were going to do it. So that was, that's been a pack. All right, special rules. We also passed special rules. No, you didn't. Where are they? Okay, they're not written down anywhere. No, you didn't pass special rules. Show us where they are, okay, if you did. And uh, so there's where you're talking about where you can pass rules that supersede Robert's rules. That, no problem with that. But they didn't pass any uh, that I can see, that I can find. And so pulling things up, uh, a consent agenda is meaningless if you can't pull something off the consent if you disagree with it and, and can't have a discussion. So that's what they're trying to do is on things that should be on the agenda that need to have a discussion. They don't want Larry Lanou and Lauren Cedarstrom to talk about them. And, you know, it's just opening up to, to lawsuits for the City of Grant. If I was a contractor with the City of Grant, I would not go ahead, okay, with, I would not go ahead with um, fulfilling that contract because it hadn't been legitimately approved. And so, and we saw that happen in Maplewood uh, with the bonding there. They, they, they didn't think uh, the bonding company thought Maplewood was playing some games. They thought they'd be open to lawsuits so they wouldn't finance the bonds and the project didn't get done. So some other measures had to take place. All right, uh, we have a caller. Caller, you have a comment or question? Thanks for calling. Well, I, I, have, a, I have a comment. Right. The interesting thing is, in November, in December, on the consent agenda, they renewed all these contracts, these three-year contracts for the contractors. Right. Okay. Last night, over the objection of Larry and myself, they made KEJ Enterprises the road commissioner and complete supervisor, negating all the contractors for uh, trimming of trees, mowing the ditches, road grading. So now all those people that went out and bought equipment are going to have to beg, instead of making the $60 an hour, they're going to have to beg to get 40 after they've went out and bought all this stuff. Now, is, is this, uh, was this on the consent agenda? 
No, this was on the, the regular agenda. Okay, on the regular agenda. But let me back up. When they censured Larry Lanou, it was not on the agenda. No one knew about it right. except the attorney and Tom Carr and maybe Jeff Huber. Right. And they, they took a vote on it. And, of course, you know, a censure requires two-thirds vote, and all they had was 30% or 60%. Right. I made that comment last night to Tom Carr, and he said, no, we passed it. And I said, didn't you have math and special education? <laughs> Did you say that in yes, the city council meeting? Yes. Oh, and goodness. also, under her breath, Tina Loban several times told Larry he was an asshole. Uh, and uh, we're going to be amplifying that, and that'll be in the all-around grant. And I'll get you the clip, too. Okay. We've also made some progress. Uh, I put a proposal to fix Keats Avenue uh, to do the, the patching and a two-inch overlay and have the city pick up the tab. Because what's wrong with, they don't have a road policy. They say everybody on the road has to pay for it. Well, what's erroneous about that, it's a feeder road. It goes into the Indian Hills. It uh -huh. has 60 residences. Uh, Sunset Lake also has 20 residences. They wouldn't pay anything in the 10 people on the road. Well, the, the problem is when you petition that, of course, like Diana Longry has won several suits in the city of Maplewood, right. you can't assess them more than it increases the value. Right. So what we've done, and I'm, I'm inching towards that, so the city's going to have it a special project, and they were erroneously reporting it cost $330,000 a mile. I brought in a solid bid from the Shifsky Corporation that they will patch the potholes, do a skim coat over them, and then put two inches of overlay and get it done for 110000 And if we don't have to go through all the paperwork of, of involving the... Uh, the, the people that live on the road, the, the, the engineer can't get 30% of the tab because that's what they charge. Yeah. So if, if, they, if you went through that rigmarole, they would get 30% of $110,000, which would kick it up to 150. dollars And what does he do? That's asphalt, that's a pothole, that's a yeah. it. Well, so, so, Lauren, I got a question. Is the 110000 for a mile's worth or three miles? It's 370, 3770, 3,770 feet. Okay. Now, that, there's three levels of that. There's the light patch and the two-inch overlay. For 154000 they can grade and reclaim the asphalt, recycle it, and then put a four-inch overlay. Uh -huh. But as I, then that's more money, and if you go to the residences for a 60-40... Then right. you're going to add another 30% to that, which pushes up to 200. Right. So I feel that I may be able to get this pushed through to fix a main feeder. The other main feeder is Joliet, which is 8,700 yeah. feet long. And we're trying to get a change in road policy. And Tina Loban actually screwed up and voted yes because she didn't understand the question. So we'll be d talking about road policy at the next meeting. Okay. Yeah. So, All right. Well, good. Thanks for the update. Uh, that was Lauren Cedarstrom from okay. uh, the Thank city you. of Grant. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, yeah. So a lot of uh, a lot of hanky panky going on in the city of Grant, and the mayor. The mayor needs to get his act together. You know, bottom line, Mayor Tom Carr. Um, it's just, it, and the citizens of Grant are suffering because of his behavior. You know, just deal with things straight up, make it legit, have the discussion, and then, uh, you know, move on. You, you don't need to be using all these bully tactics that you're using. All right, uh, an issue came up, of course, uh, on the show once in a while we cover some of the uh, Somali uh, issues, um, or the Muslim issues, and it, it's really raised its head in the uh, St. Cloud area and of course Minnesota is a big place for refugee it's I'm, I'm not against refugees uh, but the one basic philosophy a person should have is you don't provide refugee status for your enemies you know the people that uh, uh, want to destroy you you don't bring them into your community or into your culture uh, because they are there to change your culture and to destroy your community. And that's a real big problem with, that we have with Muslim, Islamists, and there is no difference, uh, uh, refugees in the community coming in. 
And so St. Cloud has raised his hair, head, and this is, a, I want to show a video from Ann Cochran, Corcoran, uh, who describes what's going on. And this is from the Center for Security Policy. So we got it on the computer here, so you're all set to go. So let's hear what she has to say about it, and then we'll uh, have some discussion afterwards. It's been over seven years since a church group from another state brought a couple hundred refugees to the rural county where I live. I wanted to know, how could they do this? What was the governmental process that allowed the resettlement of refugees to a county ill-prepared to assimilate them? Employment opportunities were scarce. The health department was not familiar with illnesses and mental health problems of people who came from parts of the third world. The school system was not prepared to teach large numbers of students who didn't speak English, and subsidized housing was scarce. I wanted to know who gave permission for what amounted to a dropping off of needy people in our county seat. So I began my research and posted everything I learned to a blog, Refugee Resettlement Watch, so that others might know what I learned about a federal program that is 35 years old this year. In summary, I discovered that the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees was choosing most of our refugees. It's under the influence of a powerful Muslim supremacist group called the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. Not surprisingly, a large number of U.S.-bound refugees are coming from countries with large numbers of people who hate us, including Somalia, Afghanistan, Iraq, and soon from Syria, just to name a few. The U.S. State Department then distributes the refugees to nine major federal contractors, six of which are so-called religious charities, but all are largely funded from the U.S. Treasury. They're not placing the plate on Sundays for the $1 billion price tag for the resettlement. And that figure does not include the extensive welfare benefits refugees receive. The refugees are then sent to over 190 cities and towns in the U.S. where the nine major contractors support 350 subcontractors. The refugees receive help from the subcontractor for up to six months and the subcontractor then submits paperwork to admit the relatives of the first group. As the years have passed, I've become increasingly alarmed by the percentage of problematic Muslim refugees admitted and distributed around the U.S. through this program. By the way, the Refugee Resettlement Program is not the only one used for legally admitting Muslims, but it is one of the most important. Many are forming cities within cities. Perhaps you know one where you live, where mosques are being built to consolidate, train, and promote a growing American Muslim population and its Islamic supremacist doctrine called Sharia. This process of Muslim colonization is called the Hijra. Mohammed told his followers to migrate and spread Islam in order to dominate all the lands of the world. He said they were obliged to do so, and that's exactly what they were doing now with the help and support of the UN, the US State Department, and the Christian and Jewish groups assigned to seed them throughout the country. Your tax dollars pay for it all. I've written this little book, Refugee Resettlement and the Hijra to America, so that you will know what is happening to us and what we can do about it. We only need to look to a troubled Europe to see the path ahead for America if we can't stop this migration and stop it soon. There's no reason on earth that we should have brought over 100,000 Somalis and another 100,000 Iraqi Muslims to America. Soon we will be resettling Syrian Muslims in large numbers. The UN at the moment has over 10,000 in a pipeline destined for our towns. The FBI told Congress recently that they cannot be properly screened. If you don't help counter the Hijra, we are, in my opinion, doomed. Over time, this migration will be more devastating to your children and grandchildren and to our country than any terrorist attack could ever be. Learn more at Refugee Resettlement Watch and SecureFreedom.org. Yeah, pretty sober uh, warning there, and in a lot of regards, it's too late. But this whole concept of the United States giving over uh, their authority to a United Nations Council. Oops, sorry here. Got to turn that off. All right. Uh, giving their authority over to the United Nations and having the United Nations decide what refugees uh, come into our country um, is a huge, huge problem. It, it should not be the United Nations doing that. 
The United States can work in cooperation with that, but we have to have the final say, the final authority. And when we're going out and we are um, giving the Organization of uh, Islamic Conference uh, on refugees, I mean, they are the ones deciding who comes in. I mean, who's going to win in that deal? Are we going to win? No. But the amazing thing is the churches that are tied into this that are receiving federal money, uh, millions of dollars, and of course nationwide billion dollars, the, the churches get money to um, place these refugees. And then, you know, the payments and the, well, the county's got to pay for a lot of it, but some of that comes from federal money. But you as a taxpayer end up paying for this. And you have people coming in who don't have your values of your not only your religious values, but your governmental process values, or the values of the Constitution of the United States. We're bringing in people who have one purpose, and that's to establish a religious state. And a religious... Um, oligarchy, I wouldn't call it an oligarchy, but a theocracy. They want their God to be the ruler and they're going to establish Sharia law. And so that's why they are pushing, especially in Michigan, uh, you've seen the effects of it strongly there where they have um, groups and if you're uh, rallies and events and if you come in and you're not a Muslim, they'll attack you. You know, or if you come in, you know, a public event, if you come in and want to have a conversation, they'll kick you out of the event. So there's no open dialogue here. This Hijra is about taking over all the countries of the world. That's their philosophy. Take it over and you do it by killing people who don't convert. It doesn't change if, if you're... Um, live in Somalia and now you live in the United States. Under their religious belief, it's the same thing. They will have the same goal. Now they're here. Now they can do it here. I mean, uh, wow, you know, watch out people. It's, it's, a big, it's a big, big problem because you won't have your religious liberties uh, anymore. And what's really interesting today is the National Day of Prayer. And uh, prayer meetings were held all across the country in some churches, not many, because they, you know, uh, whatever. They're too busy to pray for their country. You know, some churches won't even pray for their country, even though the Bible specifically commands them to, and to pray for those in authority over them, that it may go well with them. Uh, yet they refuse to do that. It, it, it's amazing. Um, so these churches, these groups, are, they're, they're loosely associated, but they are very progressive groups. And some may say that they're not really churches, but they are, because they have their 501c3, and they're doing the social justice thing, and they call it social justice. One group, uh, what the loose association would be the Isaiah group, which is trying to put socialism into uh, the uh, Minnesota, and they say justice is uh, roads and justice is transportation um, and spending more money, that's justice. And that just has very, very little to do with justice. Uh, maybe about who pays for it would more have to do with justice, but they're not even on the right side of that. Uh, so with the National Day of Prayer, we got a call coming here in just a second, not now, uh, but I just want to finish this part. What we got coming on the National Day of Prayer is uh, Pastor Saeed, who is in prison in Iran, is calling for America to have, uh, to pray for America's repentance. Uh, and that's amazing. Uh, and, but we won't have pastors here that will do it, but here's an imprisoned pastor in Iran asking for America to repent. Uh, and he needs help. He needs prayer. So we got a call. Caller, you have a comment or question? I do. Uh, th th 
that I, I know you've already moved beyond this, but uh, you had been talking earlier about the mayor of Maplewood, Smolik, about how she complained that she didn't uh, get to put on out the other side of the story right. on the uh, different shows that are, are produced that cover government. Well, this is Bob Sick, by the way, and I specifically gave her a personal invitation, her and the city manager, Melinda Coleman, to come on the show and put out what, what they felt was the, their version of the truth. Right. And, of course, neither one of them accepted. Right. And I, and I did so mention she has, that. She has no complaint. <laughs> Absolutely. This is a all phony baloney. And people that yeah. don't have ears to hear what she's saying uh, and what she's not saying and how to interpret what she's saying are going to maybe bamboozled by this. But obviously, anybody involved in government know that she's just, you know, blowing smoke. So Well, uh, not, not, not only that, but why, when a citizen gets up like Mr. Bradley, does she have the police remove them. She's, she's as, as, yeah. as uh, the, uh, bad as, as Will Ross, yeah. Billy Rossbach was. A absolutely. And so, you know. Yeah, we got to go, yeah. caller. Your time is up. All right. But you're, you're right about that. Uh, so, anyway, we're done for this week. Uh, hope you come back next week and watch. Remember, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? And good people don't do nothing. Uh, God bless. Have a great week. You said to me that you wouldn't leave, but now I see that you're lost. Sets on fire